welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart Podcast. And my guest today is Alice.DatePsych on Twitter. So Alex was highly recommended to me uh, from Taylor Burroughs, if you watched that podcast a couple of podcasts ago. So Alex, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. So Alex, uh, before we get into it, you know, I do have a, a quite a few questions I want to talk to you about today, but um, can you give the audience just a little bit of a brief background about yourself? Sure. I'm currently a graduate student. Previously, I was in a master's for uh, research in behavior and cognition, and now I'm doing behavioral and cognitive neuroscience about a week away from finishing, in fact. So wow, getting along there. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. So how did you kind of get into this role that you have? Like you, you know, obviously I just announced your, your, your Twitter handle, you know, alex.datepsych. So you're obviously, you know, very into the psychology of, of dating. So how did you kind of get into this? So I believe this kind of first sparked my interest in the previous masters when I was in a personality track, studying personality psychology and seeing how much individual differences in personality impact relationships. And it was always just a very interesting topic to me because I think they're so central and crucial to people's lives, dating, relationships of any kind across the spectrum, really. Yeah, I, I believe so too. So I don't know if you're familiar with the guy Ed Lattimore, but um, he's been on my podcast actually a couple times. And uh, he has a book where he said, you know, your life is basically broken up into three categories. He said, your health, your career, and your relationships. And, you know, a lot of people would say relationships are probably at the top of that list. Um, and so, you know, I feel that it's something that we should be, you know, discussing more and more just because, like you said, it has such an impact on everyone's kind of lives overall you know like your relationships are obviously going to affect your career they're obviously going to affect your health so and you could also you know say vice versa your career affects your your health and your relationships and in and, and, and that regard as well but i do feel that you know relationships was sort of at the top of that list and you know, that's why i've kind of chatted with more people like yourself and taylor burrells recently um but i guess we'll just kind of get into some of the the questions that that i had for you um and i was going to say some of them you know uh, that I asked of Taylor, she was like, I would defer these more to, to Alex. So, um, a couple of them are almost more from, from Taylor and, and not from me, but, um, you know, one thing that, uh, I've noticed, uh, recently, I think Taylor actually put this out was, um, what percentage of people on apps are actually attached? Because we know that a lot of people, you know, who are looking for partners, you know, that's the first place they go. You know, they don't go to the bar anymore. I mean, I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people go to apps. You know, that's the first place that they go. Um, but I saw something, I think Taylor said like two out of three people or something on apps are actually still in a relationship. Is that true? I don't know if, if two out of three people are. I'm sure that a lot of people on apps are probably dating concurrently, and I think it, of course, it will vary by apps because some are actually designed to kind of help people have affairs. But uh, it could be it could be relatively high, and I don't know if we have a really good estimate on that. I've seen estimates from five to twenty percent as far as individuals on apps that are that are currently in a relationship. And in your mind, like, is this a good avenue to go down if you are someone who's single? Like, do you think that you should be looking at apps as, as your first option? Or do you think that, you know, that's kind of a, a lesser option, maybe a, a second or third option? Uh, well, that's a, a very big question. So because there's a lot of pros and cons to apps at the same time. A pro is, you know, easily having a lot of people, maybe for some individuals, because, of course, apps don't seem to work that well for everyone. But... Uh, a lot of cons as well, particularly for young men. There's a large sex ratio imbalance on apps, for example. There's many more men to women. So a lot of men will go onto apps. Uh, they won't be able to find many matches, and it will kind of hurt their self-esteem in that sense. They'll feel very dejected. There's also an effect of serial swiping that's been demonstrated in a couple of recent studies that when people start to swipe, they like a little bit more. And as they go on and on and on, they, they reject more and more profiles. It's kind of like a choice overload effect in that sense. So it can make people feel pretty jaded when they see a lot of uh, people they might not click with. They're not getting matches with the people that they want. And then there's also the effect where people might talk for a little bit too long online when they meet in person they don't like each other it's difficult to assess attractiveness just from the photos or even from just text without some further interaction so it can be kind of a a long time waste at the same time recent research has indicated that 
depending on the study, 20% to 50% of people are saying, I met my partner on an app. So it seems to be working for a, a, some portion of people, but I think there's also high variance there that they work well for some people and for other people they don't, and they kind of harm self-esteem in that sense. And you kind of mentioned something there, you know, about, um, you know, men and women having kind of different attitudes on the app. And I think I saw Jordan Peterson uh, tweet out something recently, or maybe he posted a video about it, indicating that in general, men are more likely to favor the girl as uh, someone that they would, I guess, swipe. I'm not even sure if it's swipe right or left, but that they would actually, you know, desire more than say that the women, meaning that the women are being much, much more choosy online than the men. Is that something that you've kind of seen? Oh, absolutely. And you can see that in swiping strategies used by men and women when they look at uh, swipe rates. Women swipe on very few profiles and men will often either swipe on the profiles they like, which is going to be a much larger range, or they'll even use kind of a serial swiping strategy and just swipe on everything and see who actually gets picked. And at the same time, there's there's data on ratings of pictures, and we see that women tend to rate male photos lower than men rate female photos. You, the sex ratio, as I mentioned, is another thing that's, you know, even if everyone had just a one-one match, it would exclude about two-thirds of men on a dating app at any given moment. So yeah, big sex differences there. Interesting. So do you feel like that kind of plays into this fact? I've heard Chris Williamson talk about this recently, that... Um, men are having less sex than, than ever, I guess, in the age range, mostly in the uh, adolescent, teenage, and 20s, I think early 30s age range. Is that something that, um, that you've seen? Because it kind of seems like you know, that would correlate with the data that you just presented that you know, women are technically more choosy th than men. And so if they're being more choosy, then you would think that you know, men are going to have less available partners. So is that something that uh, you've seen in your research? Absolutely, yeah. And I think there was some data from the GSS, General Social Survey, in 2018, and it indicated that a larger percentage of men were not having sex than women. But then in the 2021 and the most recent 2022 GSS, it said, okay, sexlessness for young men and women, it's about the same. So this is probably not a trend that's just exclusive to men, but it would be something that's driven uh, in the youngest generation, the Zoomers. It's probably related to a phenomenon of extended adolescence at this point, that people are essentially delaying behaviors that lead to sex. And we also see lower risk behavior in the youth broadly, uh, less drug use, alcohol use, uh, less juvenile delinquency. They're going into work later. They're leaving the home later and getting their driver's licenses later. So all of these different behaviors that kind of cluster into things that might have led to sex in the past, the youngest adults are kind of extending that. And I think that's one of the reasons we see a decline in, in uh, sexual frequency and sexual activity kind of in that youngest cohort of adults. So, you know, that kind of sounds like a little bit of an issue, maybe even causing like some self-esteem issues. And, you know, um, as, as crass as it may sound to sound like a lot of men in that age category, you know, their self, a lot of their self-esteem, you know, right or wrong does come from how, you know, attracted they are to, you know, the opposite sex or for people who are, you know, uh, homosexual, um, the same sex, but you know, a lot of their self-esteem does come from, you know, how they're judged sexually. So like, do you feel that, uh, because, you know, men are having less sex than ever, that some of their self-esteem might be going down and they may be experiencing more mental health issues? Oh, absolutely. And certainly there's entire online subcultures kind of built around that narrative that, uh, men who cannot attract a woman or have sex or are lower in value, lower in physical attractiveness and all of these things. And I'm sure it damages their self-esteem to a great deal. And I think compounded with that, there's also an effect. Uh, there's been a lot of research on this over the last uh, decade, five years or so, that frequent exposure to social media can also impact self-esteem. You have like a downward, upward social comparisons. So I think you get those two things. You get a lot of exposure to kind of like dating discourse online that tells people like if you're not having sex you're not as good and that and then you also have media exposure to people who are and, and very attractive people online and on instagram and that sort of thing and you get that combination i think i think we do see that and we do see also as well uh don't we a an issue that has increased with with mental health in the youngest adults as well that they're reporting higher rates of anxiety and depression than previous years also so yeah, and I think you have, or maybe I'm wrong, you have done some research on, on incels. Is that correct? Yes. 
Yeah. yeah. And, so, and so that population, they are, um, from my, um, from my understanding, and I think Chris, uh, posted something recently about this, that they are more likely to, you know, engage in, um, you know, self-defeating behaviors, you know, lower self-esteem and this kind of thing. So I think it's, it's important for us to have this, you know, uh, discussion because, you know, people think that, oh, you know, you're not having sex. It's not really that big of a deal. But I think that, you know, to, um, you know, a man and a woman, you know, especially in that age category, again, if they're not, you know, engaging in sex, I think their, their self-esteem does, does drop. So, you know, um, do you see that trend kind of getting worse or do you see that improving right now? As far as that subculture specifically, I think, so there was an interesting paper from a few years ago that said, okay, we've actually seen kind of this black pill, MGTOW, which is men going their own way and incel communities increase while like the red pill and PUA or pickup artist communities have decreased and they tracked users across these forums and saw like, okay, they went from one to another. So there might be some evidence that, that subculture has grown a little bit. I'm not sure if uh, there's a lot of overlap between individuals who identify strongly with that subculture and ideology and people who are uh, literally involuntarily celibate in that sense. They, in, in, some, in a survey that I did, I asked people, like, do you identify as involuntarily celibate? Have you not had sex in the last three years? Are you part of the incel subculture? And there was pretty small correlation there. So I think a lot of people are probably being excluded. And I think that might be kind of a trend that we're seeing both for men and women, but I don't think it's necessarily resulting in a large increase in participation in that subculture and population. Okay. And, and just getting back to uh, the online dating apps, is there any um, data that indicates that if you meet your, your wife or your spouse online, that you're more likely to get divorced in the future than say, if you met them in person? That's an interesting question. And I haven't seen anything like that. And I think Online dating is maybe still so new. I don't know if anyone's done a longitudinal study and looked at looked at that. But there has been some relationship with uh, online dating and infidelity. And not specifically that everyone who uses uh, apps to find a relationship is more likely to cheat or something like that. But there, sim there seems to be two kind of personality populations and motives and goals for app users. One is like individuals who seek casual sex. And the other is individuals seeking a relationship. So about two thirds of individuals say, I'm just seeking a monogamous relationship on apps broadly. And about another third, it says, I'm seeking casual sex. They're probably open to a relationship too. But individuals that do report, like I'm seeking casual sex on an app, they do have a higher probability of being unfaithful in the future. So I could see there could be some relationship there with divorce, but I haven't seen the relationship directly in the research so far. Okay. Yeah. That's actually the kind of specific question that, uh, that Taylor said you'd be really good at answering. So I asked her about body count and, you know, I didn't really even hear this, this term until recently, but I've heard it, you know, uh, quite a bit now, you know, people are using body count to basically refer to how many people they've slept with. And so, you know, one thing that often, uh, comes up, I have a couple questions for you about this is that from what I've seen, what I've seen, every survey always shows that the woman wants the man to have more experience or to have a higher body count. Is that correct? I haven't seen much that indicated, well, there seems to be a, there seems to be kind of a sweet spot for body count for women where it's more than zero but not an excessive amount as well. There was a recent paper by Steve Stewart Williams and Andrew Thomas, two evolutionary psychologists. Well, I think Stuart Williams is an evolutionary biologist. And the curve, actually, it was pretty similar for men and women as far as like the most desirable, that typically a small range within like two to four is most desirable. If someone is a virgin, if it's zero, maybe that raises some red flags. And then as it increases, then it drops off. And I did a survey on this as well and asked people, uh, what their ideal was, and it was pretty similar. And I also asked people, at what point, if you found out someone's body count on a date or in a relationship, different questions along those lines, would you end it? And there I did see a pretty large sex difference. Men said, okay, if it was about 20, that would be a deal breaker on average, the average score. For women, it was about 40. So women do seem to at least be more tolerant of a high body count. But I don't think that they view it positively. And most of the studies say that, okay, excessively large body count is usually viewed negatively, but I think there's probably something to that, to wanting a man who has a little bit more experience. Okay. Interesting. So the heart, again, you know, there's uh, this is a science, but it's not an exact science, but overall men are okay with about up to 20. Uh, and then 
uh, with, sorry, men are okay with the woman having up to 20 and the women are okay with the men having about up to 40, roughly mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. There's a hard, there's a hard limit. The ideal much lower, it'd be four to seven or so. Okay. So the optimal, yeah. Is there an optimal one for, for men and women is for women? It's maybe like two to four, meaning that the, the man only wants the woman to be with about two to four people. And then the optimal then that the woman wants the man to have been with is about four to seven. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that sounds about right. I don't know the exact numbers I would have to check, but it's, it's within that range. It's, it's actually below 10 for, for both of them and kind of at the beginning of that. Yeah. I would say somewhere two to six, seven or something like that. Okay. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty narrow. And I think that's contrary to what a lot of people think, because the idea, of course, is uh, as a man, if you're able to have a lot of sexual partners, you're probably doing something, you know, you're passing the bar to be attractive enough to acquire multiple sexual partners. And I think people kind of see, interpret that in reverse and they say, ah, therefore, having a lot of sexual partners is attractive to women, but that doesn't apply that. The act of that itself may not be. They also too, I could see a woman saying like, oh, if a guy wants to be with that many people, he's kind of insecure and like, he's just doing this so he can like validate his own feelings because we all know guys that, you know, they, they, when they go out at night and if they don't come home with someone, they're basically depressed the next day, right? Which kind of shows that you're kind of giving away your power or your happiness to an outcome that's not, you know, within your control. Sure. You, you can control it a little bit, but you know, you can't control it completely. So, um, I can see how, you know, that data sort of, you know, uh, matches up. Um, so I want to ask you too, you know, not just about, uh, about dating, about some, some couple questions as well, but there was one question I had for, before we move on to that, but I, there was one question I had for, for Taylor and, uh, it was like, what do you think is the best book for someone to read if they are trying to, you know, seduce someone or get into a relationship? And the reason I asked that was because I, uh, discovered Mark Manson, you know, like prior to his his uh, book models, I think most people know him for um, uh, the orange book cover, uh, the subtle art of not giving a fuck, or something like that. And then the the green one uh, that says everything everything is fucked. I think it's it's called. I like the second book actually a lot better because um, he discusses a lot of Stoic philosophy in that, and I'm I'm a big Stoic philosophy guy. But I did go back and read. Um, his book models, which is kind of strange because it was after I was already, you know, with my, with my fiance, but I'm just interested in the psychology, just like I'm interested in, in, you know, speaking with you today on it. Um, but is there a book that you recommend to people, Alex, if they are getting into dating, if they want to, you know, self-improve overall? Uh, that's a, a tricky one. I read so few books. I read a lot of papers. You should day. write one is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe there, maybe there should be one. I think uh, I would recommend if anyone wants to, because I don't give a lot of dating advice and focus on that. I focus a lot on, on the research. But if anyone wanted to understand intersexual dynamics, human mating, anything by David Buss, he is kind yeah, of the, 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 the godfather of this, so to speak. So he, that would be where, where to look for all of the, the science on it. I don't think you'll find a lot of tips for like where to, how to seduce someone. But at the same time, I think that's a really good starting place for anyone that wants to understand male-female dynamics. Yeah. And if you want to get familiar uh, with him, I know David Buss did a podcast with Rogan fairly recently. It was, uh, wasn't like yesterday or anything, but it's definitely within the, in the past six months. Uh, I think I got through most of it and it did seem to be, um, you know, a, a fantastic uh, podcast. So um, I'm glad that we uh, discussed that. Um, so I'm going to try to move on a little bit now to more in, into couples. And this was actually a question that I had for Taylor that I totally forgot to ask her, but it comes up all the time, even with conversations with, with my friends, why do couples stop making out? Cause it seems like in the first three months or so, you always sort of, you know, just kiss sometimes, you know, I mean, obviously it can lead to other things as well, but there's times where you basically, you know, are just kissing, you're just kind of making out. But I find that couples, they never really make out. Like the only time they make out is when they're having sex. So is there any, uh, like reason for that? Or is there any data on why that occurs? I don't know if that question specifically has been answered, but I think I can give you a, a, a well-researched, uh, informed answer on this. Okay. So we can begin with like Sternberg's triangular theory of love. And this is, there's some controversy on this, but I think the facets of love in it are pretty well correct in that sense. 
You have at the beginning, when people fall in love, what's called passionate love. And that tends to be that feeling that invokes like, I want to be around this person all the time. I want to touch them. I feel pain when I'm not with them. Then as time goes on, that tends to fade and it tends to be replaced or kind of emerge concurrently with a companionate love or a committed love. And that tends to be what you see long-term in relationships that work. Usually, simply at the beginning of a relationship, that passion fades. And related to that, you also see general declines in relationship satisfaction in most relationships, just as a normal pattern of relationships. People tend to be happier at the beginning, and then over time, longitudinally, they report less. And I think that's basically all that it comes down to, is that in a way, and it's kind of bleak in a sense, you could say that everyone falls out of love over a period of time, even within a relationship, but it's only a shifting of, of love or perhaps a dampening of that initial passionate love. And that's probably a good thing because if you felt like that for years and years and years, I imagine it would destroy you inside because when people feel that way where they want to make out with a partner all the time and spend time with them and all of that, the minute they're not with them, they're just in a state of anxiety. They're missing them and everything. So it's probably good that people kind of calm down a little bit, but yeah. And, and, you know, if people want to be that way, they, they often have to deliberately cultivate it. They have to go out of their way to plan dates and create time for intimacy and that sort of thing as well. So it's basically, it's perfectly normal for, you know, couples not to be continuously in the honeymoon phase, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. Honeymoon phase also called that. And yeah, it's, it's a phase. That's why it's called honeymoon phase. It's completely normal for that to end. And hopefully people can still maintain some kind of passion and connection despite yeah. that. But not everyone's going to feel like a teenager that just met their first girlfriend for years and years and years on end. I, I remember actually uh, Jordan Peterson talking about this and how, you know, he said that like, of course you think your mistress is, you know, better than the person that you're with because you're always only meeting them on the most perfect terms. You know, like when you're with your, your wife, you know, there's kids around, you guys have things to do, there's errands to run, you have to run the house. You know, there's, there's lots of things that you guys have to do together. There's busy schedules, but you know, when you meet with like your mistress, so to speak, you're, you know, done work, you're probably looking your best, you're making sure that you're in a good mood that you're, you know, meeting on this like, like perfect occasion. So, you know, that doesn't happen all the time in relationships. And I think that's what happens to people, uh, you know, when they when they have a mistress, and they think, oh, this is so much better. And it's like, no, it's not better. It's just because you're only meeting them on absolute perfect circumstances. Like if you had brought this person into a relationship, you're going to have to deal with all the same problems that you're having in your current relationship yeah exactly it's it's very much very much that like as you said always on on the best terms the best foot forward and then the novelty of it as well that it's someone new so it's so it's exciting and, and you have to wonder you know if you uh, were with the mistress mistress instead for 15 years or something would it still be as exciting probably not it yeah. might have been a very similar outcome or or it may have be every case is going to be a little bit different but yeah it raises a lot of questions like that so one thing that's kind of been you know popularized over uh the last 10 or 20 years it seems maybe it's it's been longer i just you know wasn't really uh, attuned to it but there is this you know discussion of polygamy that's going on now i think a lot of people are rejecting it now and they do i mean some people even my viewers and i kind of agree with them that it may be even part of like this like woke agenda you know that, that's kind of being like pushed on people to destroy uh the family unit by making it uh by normalizing it instead of you know stigmatizing it anyways i'm not like judging anybody on how they live their life but you know the data on on polygamy does it basically seem that it never ever works out or what's the data that you've seen overall well, something that seems to be pretty clear across the world in research on polygamy is that when women have more choice, they tend not to choose polygamy. So at the very least, as far as it goes for women, for that kind of deal, it doesn't seem to be a good deal. Most people do not want to share a mate. It's, it's really that simple. And there's some discourse out there like, oh, women will share a high value man. People do not want to share their mates. We seem to be adapted very strongly for a dyadic pair bond. We experience love that kind of blinds us to other people. Uh, when we're in love with someone, we, you know, kind of blind to other people. We experience a lot of jealousy that has, you know, evolved to kind of foment that pair bond, mate guarding to make sure like, you know, it's just us, keep other people away. And it seems very, very difficult for people to 
function in a relationship that is polygamous. And I guess polyamory also seems to raise those kinds of questions as well. It's, it seems very common in a lot of these poly subcultures, if you watch their media and stuff, that there is one partner that struggles with jealousy a lot. And there's kind of a lot of coaching like, how do I address my jealousy when my partner's on a date with another woman? And this could last years and years and years. So I think, of course, you know, there's a spectrum of, of psychology and emotion. Some people can do it, but I think for most people, they, they really can't. And, and it's probably not going to work out. And, I, and kind of like you said, like, like a woke agenda, so to speak. I do think people think ideologically, like, uh, why should I be monogamous? Why should I get married? Why can't we just have free love? Okay, great. So you've formed that belief. But when you're, in, when you're actually in a relationship, right, and you're in love with someone, and then they're like, okay, I'm going to go have sex with someone else now, see how that actually makes you feel inside. It might not match up with, with the beliefs that you think are cool that you wanted to adopt, you know? Yeah, I, I think so, too. I mean, I think it's normal to be attracted to other people other than the person that you're with, but that doesn't mean that you have to act on it. And I think that's what, you know, where people get tripped up is they think that, you know, I'm attracted to someone else. This is natural. That's what, you know, people kind of call it. They think it's more a natural way of living, you know, why don't you just kind of act on it? But that's really, you know, you're getting into hedonism then. And, you know, once you get into that, you know, then you're basically just acting on all of your impulses. You're not really thinking or making any good decisions. So, you know, I can see how it's, um, you know, not worked out for people. Like I don't really, I kind of know one person uh you know that, that i've met that is that it did it for a little bit and then you know they stopped doing it basically and i've never met anybody else who, who said that you know they uh, they have a polygamous relationship and it's worked out well in the long term so um yeah i i agree i think it's it's an idea that you know uh, again no judgment on anyone if you do it and <clears throat> maybe you have figured out a way to do it but i think that for the most part um it's not the best way to go and i think monogamy uh, has proven that you know it's it's a much much more viable thing to do in the long term and i know you know divorce rates are high and, and all that but it, it does still mean you know over 50 percent of people do stay together it is definitely possible um and so, you know, if you want to stay in, in a relationship, uh, one question I, I had for you is, uh, you know, how many dates, like what's the optimal amount of dates that people should go on in a week or in a month? Uh, because we all know that, you know, people get into relationships and then they kind of stop dating. You know, they may not go out for dinner anymore, may not go out for movies or just kind of, you know, do kind of typical dating activities. So if you are in a relationship and you want to maintain it, you know, how many dates a week or how many dates a month uh, should you be going on? I wish I knew an exact number of, of, of how many dates there should be, but, but I think you're getting at a good point. You have to uh, deliberately cultivate that connection still. You still have to go on dates. And I think it's probably also actually related to that since I can't, come up with a number and tell you exactly how many dates. If I had to guess, I, I would say at least once or twice a week to, to maintain it. But I think what's really important as far as that, if, if I were to think about it, is probably not just going to get food, but going on a date that is romantic in a sense, that, that kind of does mirror that early dating phase. And I would think if that happens, then it's probably the quality of those dates that would have more an effect than, than the quantity and, and all of that. So you got to, you know, keep up with like the courting, like it's not just, okay, I'm going out to dinner and, you know, this is something that I'm going to do nice for her. It's like, you know, I'm going to go on a, on a date, like I'm going to treat her like it's our first date. I'm going to, you know, try to impress her, so to speak, and make sure that, you know, she has a good time. And I think that's an important part too, like, especially for uh, the guys, like, you know, if you... If you can make sure that she has a good time, then I think that, you know, you're going to have a good time in, in, in return because, uh, you know, something that uh, I borrow from uh, Tony Robbins, he says, you know, if you can, if it lights you up to light the other person up, then done deal kind of thing. So I think that's sort of one of the key factors that needs to be um, thought about when you are doing on those dates is make sure that you're in a place where like it lights you up to light the other person up. When you do that, I think both of you are just going to have, you know, a fantastic time overall. Um, I do have another number question for you, but maybe you'll have a little bit more data on this one. I'm, I'm not sure, um, but I'm sure we can kind of make a good educated guess anyway. So how many times a week should couples be having sex or how many times a month should, should they be having sex? Well, here's the thing for a couple, if they're already having sex two or three times a week, they're already well above the mean. And that seems to work well. Which seems and what to, is the mean? The mean, well, I think about 50% of 
committed couples are not having sex over the course of a month entirely. So there's wow. essentially a very high number of sexless long-term relationships, often marriages, older individuals. I think in younger individuals, it's a little bit less common. You said 50% of couples go a month without having sex? Yeah, I believe so. It's Sexlessness is actually quite high in, in some, some long-term relationships. I think though, they're going to be older, but you start to see that around the 30s, that, that sexlessness emerges pretty pretty strongly in a, in a large cohort of committed relationships. As far as how many times per week, there's actually a lot of individual variation in, in libido and in the desire to have sex. So some people are going to be fine with just like a couple of days a week because that's all they want. And other people are going to need it more. So I think what's really important is kind of being on the same level with a romantic partner in that sense, kind of that sexual compatibility that there's a similar drive and that one partner is not struggling with sex when the other uh, or struggling with a desire for sex when the other person doesn't want to have sex because particularly for men in general that's also a way that men kind of feel loved and feel accepted so sexual rejection in that case can be uh, a problem it can feel like like someone is being rejected and unloved okay that's yeah i i mean i always think that it's like twice a week is at least the amount that you should be aiming for you know more is probably better i'm not i think the returns like you know probably diminish a little bit after you know twice a week just like anything else um but i think that you know w at once is like you know absolutely necessary i i believe and then twice i think would be better overall and you know that's again not to bring him up again but jordan peterson had mentioned that in his uh, uh most recent book uh beyond order the one that he had out, out a few years ago um one question that a lot of people ask, and this happens, I guess, more when people are older and maybe sometimes when they have more medical problems like, like snoring or sleep apnea, um, but do you think that couples, it's okay for them to sleep in separate beds or do you think that couples should sleep in the same bed? I think, I think that also kind of depends a lot. I think in general, uh, like you said, if there's specific reasons for it, like sleep apnea or something like that, then okay, then maybe it makes sense. But if you have a situation where someone starts to sleep outside of the bed in another room, you have to ask, okay, what else is going on here that makes them not even want to come to bed or maintain the same kind of schedule, for example, those sorts of things. So that can kind of raise a lot of questions. I think on balance, it's probably better to sleep in the same bed, although some people it kind of disrupts their sleep. So that's that's kind of the, the, the trade-off there. But I think in general, I think most people would prefer that. Yeah, I think I saw uh, Dr. William Wallace. He's been on uh, the podcast a couple of times. He's a very, very good uh, researcher. But he had actually indicated it was it was kind of surprising that um, couples who slept together actually had about a 10% more of an increase in REM sleep. Because we always hear about, you know, uh, couples sleeping together and, and then not, um, you know, one of them maybe sleeping poorly because of the other person. And I think it's, you know, just like you said, Alex, you have really, it's, it really comes up to like the, the individuals, because if someone does have a serious, you know, sleep apnea issue where the person is snoring, I mean, I think it would be better than maybe to have separate beds, but I think the goal should always be to, you know, try to sleep in the same bed. But again, you know, you have to look at the individuals and then if there is a reason why, you know, sleeping in separate beds would make things better, then, you know, you should do that and not necessarily feel like a shame for it. You know, you're making your relationship better by doing that, not by making it, you know, worse. So I think you should have the goal of doing it, but, you know, it shouldn't be enforced, particularly when, you know, medical, uh, medical issues um, come up like that. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, how many dates you should go on a week and, and you know, how many times you, you should have sex a week. Um, what about just like the general communication? Again, like Jordan was saying, like, you know, you should have about 90 minutes, I think he said a week where you basically are just talking about your relationship only. So when you go on those dates, you know, what is it you like, what would, you know, you don't want to make your relationship too scientific, so to speak, you know, you do want it to be natural, but what sorts of, you know, conversations are healthy to have during these dates that would potentially improve your relationship? I think people should talk about their goals and their values, kind of where they want to go into the future. But there, I think also there should be kind of a balance between banter and flirting and also serious topics, because mm -hmm. a lot of communication 
uh, Good point. comes down to comes down to very subtle things that are communicated kind of non-verbally. So kind of that vibe, so to speak. And I think what this this vibe is basically describing is kind of an emotional uh, heuristic decision-making ability. The ability to pick up on subtle cues in another person and respond to how they're feeling in that moment. And I think in a lot of ways that's perhaps more important than the specific topics. But at the same time, uh, I think people should ask questions about the other person a lot to try to get to know them very well about yeah, goals, values, but also more superficial things shouldn't be underestimated as far as their importance as well, just to kind of get an idea overall. And I think too, it's good to talk about, you know, practical uh, things as well. Like a lot of people will have issues about, you know, who's doing what in the house, you know, who's taking care of the kids, that kind of thing. I think those things are things that need to be discussed at those times as well. And I mean, you don't want to necessarily always talk about like serious subjects, like, like you just said. And I think you always have to take into account the, you know, the other person's um, uh, you know, how they're feeling that, that particular day, you know? So, you know, if I'm, for example, uh, you know, if I'm working like from nine to six, a lot with patients, then that night, like, I'm probably not going to want to, you know, talk about anything too, too serious. I probably just kind of want to like relax, maybe a little bit silly and have fun. Right. But say if, you know, it's a Saturday or a Sunday and, you know, there's not much going on and I'm pretty relaxed. I think then maybe it's the time to maybe, you know, then you can maybe talk about something a little bit more serious because you can only, you know, tolerate so many serious subjects or so many, um, you know, serious topics in one particular day. So I think it's good for couples to kind of, you know, go back and forth with that. So, you know, maybe on the dates, you know, you try and keep it, you know, fairly light, so to speak. And then, you know, you do have your other times when you're kind of both not stressed out. And maybe that's when you're talking more about the practical terms of the relationship. Exactly. Yeah. You kind of have to feel it out and match the mood of the other person and bring up the appropriate topics and uh, conversation at the appropriate moment. If someone's stressed out, they, they might just need comfort. They might want something light. If everything is uh, calm, then maybe that's a better time to have a, a serious discussion. Yeah, I, I, I think so as well. And so, Alex, you know, you're very, very well, well credentialed. You've been studying, uh, you know, dating, you know, for a while now. So um, what are some things that you've studied that you feel that a lot of people may not know about or things that you've kind of been surprised through your research? Oh, gosh, it's such a broad question. I'm going to have to it is, it is think, a broad think, question. Yeah. think of something on the spot here. So I think perhaps something that surprises a lot of people is uh, the orgasm gap that a lot of women don't experience orgasm during sex and that it's very, very small for casual sexual encounters as well. And I, and I think this is for men specifically that, that don't understand that because as men, we think almost like any sex is good sex. You go out and you have a casual sexual experience. You're going to experience an orgasm. It's probably going to be a good experience no matter how, how bad it is, so to speak. For women, not the case that about eight to 10% of women can orgasm during a casual sexual encounter. And then that increases to about 60% regular orgasms during a committed relationship. So there's a strong uh, relationship between sexual pleasure and being in a committed relationship for women. And I think that's something that men often kind of misjudge about the landscape. They tend to think like, you know, if I were a woman, I would just have casual sex all the time because that's what you would do as a man. But sex differences there kind of make it not nearly as desirable for, for women. Those are insane numbers, though. So you're saying that when a woman has casual sex, her chances of having an orgasm are 8 to 10%. But if she's in a relationship, her chances of having an orgasm are about 60 to 70%. Is that right? Exactly. And you even see it climb incrementally as it goes on. So the first casual sexual experience, very low, 8 to 10%, goes up a little bit to the second one. And you get kind of an ongoing thing. And there's probably two reasons for that. It's probably, you know, a bi-directional relationship. You have people, if the sex is really bad at first, maybe they don't continue seeing them at all. So you have a selection effect. But also, as people become more experienced, and this is more important for women, as you know, a male becomes more in tune with his female partner, he might pay more attention to what she likes. The sex does get better. And that seems to be really important for women, that having sex with one person over time kind of makes it better. 
Yeah. So yeah, I mean, men and women are built very, very differently that way. So, you know, it's easy for, you know, a man to have an orgasm. It's a lot more difficult for, you know, a woman to have an orgasm. So it's really, it's that intimacy and that closeness that's, I guess, getting the women to orgasm when they're with, when they're in a relationship. Is that right? It's more the, the intimacy, the intimacy component for the woman. I think so. I think that's, that's very, very important that there has to be some kind of emotional connection, some kind of uh, safety, a feeling of trust as well. And the connection that is a learned experience between the couple through their sexual interactions of, okay, she likes this and hopefully he's doing those sorts of things. And, and I would imagine too, that in an intimate relationship, there's probably going to be a lot more foreplay. And also too, if you have, you know, experience with that particular person, then you're going to understand what foreplay that person uh, particularly likes. Whereas if you're just in a casual sex relationship, obviously, if it, and if it's the first encounter, then you literally have, you know, no experience with that particular individual. So I think that would make uh, a pretty big difference overall as well. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. It's exactly that kind of learning what they like over time. And people might not even be very considerate on the first uh, sexual encounter, that sort of a thing. So a lot that can really knock that number down and reduce kind of the enjoyment for women in these these casual encounters. So one, one question that I have for you too comes down to like incels versus say like the pickup artist. So, you know, obviously uh, both of these groups of people um, are probably suffering for you know, very, very different reasons. But in your opinion, um, I know we touched on it a little bit earlier. Like if someone's goal is just to have casual sex over and over and over, like, do you even consider that like a mental health disorder? Or would you consider it, uh, you know, something that, you know, is, is going to really decrease the person's overall sense of well-being in, in the future? Yeah, that's, there's, an interesting question there. If someone's goal is only to have casual sex, you have to wonder if they have a difficulty forming an emotional attachment with someone at all. And there's been a lot of discourse about like, oh, does having a lot of sex ruin someone's ability to pair bond? But it's probably in reverse. You probably have people that are unable to form an emotional attachment with someone, that are unable to maintain a relationship as well, even if they do. And so they just seek casual sex. It probably is the case that there's some underlying difference in personality, perhaps some underlying difference in mental health as well. And there's a lot of things that contribute to that. Uh, someone with very high sociosexuality is one, which is not a, a mental health illness, but it's just a personality difference. In that case, you would have someone that's just simply open to it. But you also have, for example, people who are more likely to do that are more likely to score high in the dark triad, a cluster of antisocial personality traits as well. Uh, you have some mental health uh, disorders or personality disorders associated with that borderline personality disorder would be one uh, narcissists seem to be a little bit more likely to engage in that pattern of behavior as well you have the attachment styles someone who's avoidantly attached you might see them accumulate more partners over time as well because they can't maintain that relationship they push people away so a lot of things like that okay interesting um and one topic that I, uh, I I have to ask you about today because it comes up so much is uh, pornography. So, you know, I've seen so many articles about you know the the science behind uh, the dopamine and how you know pornography is basically you know not very good for you overall. It can really you know uh, decrease your dopamine response, where um, you know basically your 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 overall well being just really deteriorates. Um, and then I listened to a little bit of the uh, Dr. Rena Malik and uh, Huberman podcast the other day, and she was kind of saying you know that only maybe about three or four percent of people who watch pornography get addicted to it so you know what is your view on pornography both as a single person and both and also as someone who's in a, in a relationship okay so for someone who's in a relationship first this because there's a lot of research on pornography that kind of goes back and forth. I think there's a lot of debate there and it's become very controversial as far as what effects it has on the brain and relationship satisfaction. But what does seem to be clear in the relationship or as far as relationship satisfaction, when someone is in a relationship and their partner disapproves of pornography use, that seems to be when you get when you get problems there, you know? So that's the first thing someone should be asking if they're in a relationship and they're a user of porn, they should think, you know, what would my partner think? Because if they're in a relationship with someone who doesn't like it, which I imagine is kind of a general rule in relationships, if you're doing something 
that your partner thinks is like cheating, basically. You're just asking for problems. And, and that's a very, you know, uh, people treat that kind of like is independent from like, is porn harmful to the individual? Well, if you're in a relationship, you're in a diet at that point. And what will determine your relationship outcomes is your interaction with the other person, not just if porn is like good or bad for you. So that's one thing to consider right off the bat. If your partner doesn't care about porn, maybe you can toss that out the window and say, okay, we can look at the individual uh, factors then. All kinds of behaviors can become impulsive and addictive in that sense and cause problems. And one of the diagnostic criteria a lot uh, across different addictive disorders, and I don't believe pornography is in the DSM, but I'm talking about a specific criteria that is used kind of across disorders to assess like, is this a normal behavior or a problematic behavior? And, and it's the question like, does this cause problems in a person's life? For example, if you drink a few beers every day, but you have no problems, you're not gonna get diagnosed you know, with alcoholism typically. If you're drinking and you know, you're know you getting assessed and they say, okay, you know, you've been in a bunch of DUIs, you, your wife broke up with you because you drink too much, then you have that criteria fulfilled of like, okay, this is causing problems in your life. And so individuals would have to ask themselves as well, like, how do I personally feel about the pornography use? You have some people who are uh, habitual users, but they feel guilty about it. They feel bad about it. And at the same time, you have people that will say, you know, well, we should get them so they don't feel guilty. Okay, yeah, but they do. And in that case, you have to kind of reconcile the fact that these people feel bad about their own use. And that is kind of causing problems for them in that sense, even if it's not frying their brains, so to speak. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So again, it comes down to the, the individual level. What about if, if uh, a couple wants to watch it together? Is that something that's more common now? And is there any research or data on that if it's beneficial or detrimental to the couple? So I've read a little bit of research on this that indicated like, okay, this can be something healthy, which is typically seems to be the case as far as, uh, dyadic sexual behaviors and kind of experimentation. Usually when partners get to a point like that, okay, so they're on the same page about how they feel about it. So they're probably not gonna have a big problem with it. And they're, they're trying something new together and kind of experimenting. And usually that kind of results in, in positive affect, at least for a short period of time, because there's kind of a, a shared, shared experience there. So I, I think that's probably not gonna be particularly harmful. I don't think it's that common either, but I would have to, uh, something I'd have to look more into. Okay. Okay. And how about, how do you feel about when couples uh, are together, but they, but they, uh, you know, they obviously um, masturbate individually. Like, is that something that's, you know, not good for the couple? Is it something they should share with their partner? Or like, what does the data show on if, you know, one partner or maybe both partners are, you know, masturbating on their own, uh, but maybe not having as much sex, or maybe they are still having sex. Is there any data on that? Uh, I think what, what that can reflect in men is kind of a desire for novelty. So, and, and that and that can be a, a red flag or at least a yellow flag. It can be a warning sign because if if someone is becoming less attracted to their current partner, they're masturbating frequently by themselves and that sort of thing. They're seeking pornography. Uh, they're basically kind of supplanting that desire for another. In that sense, it's the same drive that would you know the same evolutionary drive part of uh, male sexual strategies to seek novelty outside of the relationship. So is it something that's going to lead to a problem in itself? You know, again, it kind of depends. How does the partner view that? Would they, would they find that bad? Like he doesn't want to have sex with me anymore, but he just wants to look at porn and masturbate. I think a lot of people would have a problem with that. And I think it may also reflect something deeper, which is kind of a loss of attraction in the spouse and a loss of interest in the relationship and a seeking of sexual partners vicariously right through pornography outside of the relationship. Okay. So is, is there anything though, what you said, you know, that's kind of men's sort of like novelty, like they're always trying to, you know, find someone like new, I guess, so to speak. So does, is this something that, um, you know, wears off or how do you, like, how does a man kind of deal with this innate, uh, sensation of always wanting, you know, a new partner or novel or, or novelty? Well, I don't think there's a way to reverse that feeling or a way around it. That's kind of that's kind of the trick there. So how does someone deal with that? Essentially asking, like, how does someone not cheat? You know, if, if a beautiful woman is in front of you in your relationship, how do you not have sex with her? And, and that's, you know, a very kind of deliberate choice. Individuals have to decide if they're going to do something or not, kind of based on a very conscious decision. Because the feeling, you know, of, of being attracted to other women or something like that is probably not going to go away. It's going to be much stronger in some individuals than others. 
And there's a lot of personality differences as well in men that come down to like, you know, is he more oriented monogamously? Will he do things that destroy his relationship? Even, you know, will he take those risks to seek novelty, actually to seek it outside of the relationship? Certainly there are little things people do in relationships, like role playing and that sort of thing to kind of like spice up novelty in a sexual sense as well, which could be kind of helpful. But I think that that drive, that sort of parallel mating strategy where men want to have a monogamous relationship, but they might also kind of be interested on things in the side. I think that's something people have to make a deliberate choice in their own life to say, okay, am I going to do this or, or not? You know, and really think it through in that sense, not act impulsively. And so essentially, you know, what you're saying is that the man just has to, you know, shut it down and not do it, so to speak. And there's no real, you know, alternative there. It's just like, this is a desire that you're always going to have. You have to deal with it and you just have to get used to, you know, shutting things down and understanding that you're just with one spouse and this is going to have, you know, the best outcome for your health and for your life overall. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there's going to be individual variation in how strongly some men feel that some men are going to feel like a really strong attraction toward other other women and all of that perhaps just related to higher libido for example and some are going to be much more tempted to actually cheat but yeah there's there's a choice that has to be made like are you just going to shut it down are you going to cheat or are you going to leave the relationship for for someone else and those are you know things people they have to think about deliberately and make make a very conscious decision on that for whatever of those three three options they're going to choose and and how does that kind of play into uh body count like if you have like a higher body count coming into the relationship, are you going to seek more novelty because you're used to having new partners? Meaning if someone has a higher body count, are they going to have a more difficult time with a, with a monogamous relationship? Because some people always say the opposite. They'll say, oh, you have to get it out of your system before you're in a monogamous relationship. But from what I see and, and from what my conversation with Taylor and some of the, the, the little data that I've seen is that that's not true. Like you're higher the, the body count, uh, the more the, the novelty is going to be an issue for you. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I agree with, with Taylor on that. And I, I think, again, I think the relationship is kind of the other way. I don't think that people have a lot of novelty, so it makes them like want more novelty. I think these are people, because this is a, you know, this is, all of these personality traits are highly heritable. I think some people are just like that, where they have always needed more novelty and they always seek more novelty. But that also means if someone enters a relationship, they have a very high body count, so to speak, you can kind of use that as an indicator of like, ah, you know, what does this mean for our relationship? Because one of the reasons people accumulate a very high body count is because they couldn't stay in a relationship very long, you know, or because they sought a lot of casual sex or because they cheated, that sort of a thing. There is a correlation between higher sexual partners and infidelity, all of that. So it, it does kind of raise questions and you can't generalize to every single individual from you know the average trend. You can't know for sure, like someone's gonna cheat on me because they had a lot of partners, but it is one of those things you know that you have to kind of be aware of in that sense. Okay, and one question that I, I had to uh, uh, ask you about too, you know, it comes up uh, over and over where I see that, you know, the, the thing that women want the most in men is someone who is dangerous but also disciplined. And this is kind of borrowed from, uh, from Jordan Peterson again and also uh, Jocko Wilnick a little bit as well. But essentially, that's sort of what they're looking for is like someone who has all who they could be bad if they wanted to, but they essentially choose not to be bad. Is that more or less the, what you've seen on, in the research that you've done? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think. That that is is very correct. I think I believe it was Jeffrey Miller, the evolutionary psychologist. He also uh, coined a term, the tender defender, which is kind of like that. And it is it's going to be yeah, someone who's capable of aggression, who's not a pushover, you know, who's maybe a little bit high status or something like that, who is aggressive enough, but not someone who is going to be dangerous to the woman. Because women are always you know that's something very attuned in women. Because men much larger physically. Uh, pose a large uh, danger to women, particularly in an ancestral environment. And at the same time, women need a man like that to protect them in the ancestral environment. So there's kind of this balance, this this balance between seeking someone who is capable of that violence and aggression, kind of like Jordan Peterson said, but who will not use it against her, right? And that's, that's kind of where you get it. I, I talked about this in the past. I said a really good example of this actually 
Uh, and I ran a poll. I ran a poll. I posted the cartoon from Robin Hood, the fox, and okay. Brad Pitt. And I asked women, I said, which of these would you rather date? And just overwhelmingly said, Robin Hood, the fox. I said, okay, sure. But it's not just like a physical thing. There's an archetype there in Robin Hood. So he's an outlaw. He's a bad boy. But he loves Maid Marian. He's very charismatic. He protects her. But he's he's beating the other dudes up. But, but again, he's an outlaw still. He's a thief. So he does kind of some roguish things. So you get all of these different things mixed in that character that he's very charismatic in that sense. And I think, yeah, that's exactly it. It's it's the bad boy, but not like the evil boy, right? Yeah, you don't want someone who's going to end up in jail and, and can't... Uh take care of you or provide for you. And you want someone who, who's going to be able to, to be around. Um, yeah, I think, I think David Buss went over that pretty well in this podcast with Rogan. And it seems like, you know, that's what Jordan's kind of been, I don't know if, if teaching is the right word, but has been putting out a lot of, on his Instagram is to, you know, make sure that you, uh, like the first part of dating really is like improving yourself. And again, coming back to Mark Manson's book models, like, you know, I was impressed with that book because it was more or less a book on self-improvement. Like you were saying earlier a moment ago about like status. So like, you know, if you want to become a better catch, it's not just like about how you, you know, interact with that particular person. I mean, that certainly is going to make a difference, but it's also just about improving yourself, like getting yourself in good shape, making sure that, you know, you have a good career, uh, making sure that, you know, you you have a good head on your shoulders and these kind of things. Like, I think that's, you know, something that sometimes is um, uh, not put out in some of these like pickup artist type type of books where they, you know, use tactics as opposed to ways to improve yourself overall as a man. And I think that that's what, you know, people need to focus on is you need to improve yourself overall as a man, like make yourself, you know, for lack of a better, you know, term, a high value man, as opposed to just learning particular tricks that, you know, may work on, you know, one particular woman one night, but, you know, they're not going to lead to a, uh, you know, a fulfilling uh, relationship in the long term. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think the tricks are only going to get people so far. And something that really frustrated me at the beginning when I started kind of looking into like these pickup seduction communities is there were a lot that were essentially getting people to try to emulate the dark triad, which is a, you know, antisocial personality construct. So individuals that score higher in the dark triad, they do have more sexual partners on average, although they tend to select less attractive sexual partners as well. They're, they're less choosy in that sense. But you had all of these people for a long time saying, emulate the dark triad, emulate the dark triad. And it's like, okay, for one, these people have, you know, they may have more sexual partners, but they have disaster relationships. For two, personality is very stable over the lifetime. It's going to be really hard for the average guy to actually emulate someone who is kind of like, you know, uh, dark triad, so to speak, right? High in narcissism, Machiavellian, uh, psychopathy. Very difficult for someone who's like a normal guy, especially like kind of timid, getting into pickup or whatever. Yeah. Be like, yeah, you need to be a dark triad now. That's not even a reasonable strategy for most people. So it's, yeah, trying to teach people these tricks, there's no shortcut, you know, to making yourself a desirable person. That's a long road and a lot of work. Yeah, the best thing to do is, is to put in the work and, and make yourself a better person overall. Um, so Alex, I think our hour is basically up here now. Uh, you've been a fantastic guest. Really appreciate all the questions that you've answered for me today. So where can people find you on Twitter and where can they learn more about you and your work? Sure. So I have date psych on Twitter and then the website datepsychology.com. I got a YouTube channel, alex.datepsych, I think it is. So all of those places. Amazing. Well, thank you so much again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. uh, All the questions that you answered today. And thank you so much, everyone for listening. And as always, I'll be back again next week.